Hey there, fight fans. Welcome to the UFC 237 post-fight show, Nami Yunus vs. Andraj, brought to you by SB Nation MMA, which includes BloodyElbow.com and also MMAMania.com, the only two websites on the entire World Wide Web you're ever going to need to visit for all of your needs, especially if you're into mixed martial arts. My name's Flying Brian J, and with me as usual are the guys from the sixth round post-fight show, Mr. Positivity, Eddie Mercado, and Major Zane Simon. If you don't want spoilers, don't click on a post-fight show, for one. What we just watched was Thug Rose Nami Yunus get dropped on her head in the second round by Jessica Andrade. So we got an and new. On top of a card that wasn't that good, the finish was fantastic. The majority of the card kind of sucked. Zane, we talk about it a lot, that the main event makes up for a rather lackluster undercard. Did that happen here with Jessica Andrade's finish? Uh, it's a, that the metrics are different for pay-per-view. I mean, they gotta be. <coughs> what Andrade did to Nami Yunus was cool, but that Jose Aldo fight had to carry... Aldo Volkanovski was supposed to carry a lot of the weight for the fun of this card. That was supposed to be, like, the cool fucking fight. And Aldo never got out of first gear. And it's really hard then to look at this main card and be like, I mean, I, you know, people who are fans of the main event, a lot of times, even for pay-per-view main events, people are going to be like, no, I had fun. That was awesome. Whatever. But between Anderson Silva blowing his knee out, although just kind of drifting to a loss and then two scrappy, but meaningless fights between Aldana and Coea and Star Poli and Alves. Like, it, it definitely did not feel like a pay-per-view event. No, definitely didn't feel like a pay-per-view. Probably should not have been a pay-per-view event. Um, and, like, you know, I was telling Brian this all throughout the pay-per-view. I'm just like, I can't believe this is a pay-per-view. Like, we're paying yeah. for this shit. I like, think if, if Aldo Volkanovsky had really over-delivered and if Anderson had been able to, like, stay fun and funky, whatever happened, then... and. Even, you know, if maybe if uh, Fajera versus Trinaldo had still happened and been like a wild brawl, then this whole card could have carried as like fun and entertaining and whatever. But like I say, Aldo Volkanovsky, when, once that, that Trinaldo Fajera fight got canceled, Aldo Volkanovsky was the glue. That was the thing that was supposed to make all the rest of this stick. It's like, oh yeah, Jose Aldo tearing through the prospects putting the hammer down on featherweight proving that if even if he never beats max holloway he's still one of the absolute best in the world and then volkanovsky being this brutal driven unstoppable new prospect can he do it again and it just kind of been like was like aldo just not just couldn't figure volkanovsky out at all volkanovsky didn't even have to hurt him or tire him out you know yeah it was a flat showing from jose aldo yeah Who's like who's been anything but as a flake? Yeah, and I know he had the knee infection a few weeks out that like limited his training and stuff. So I'd like to say that was it, but that didn't look like it. It didn't look like Aldo was out there fighting injured or fighting unprepared or anything like that. It just looked like he just was getting like outpointed in ways that didn't allow him to land big shots, and that that stuck him. Yeah, and all credit to Volkanovski because he. Yeah. Did he was able to out volume Aldo and then use that volume to get on the inside, grab a hold of Aldo, stifle him against the cage, land these chipping shots, and just eat away at the clock. Yeah. A very smart game plan, and it's really textbook Volkanovski. Like, that's just what the fuck he does. And yeah. Aldo couldn't stop it. Nope. It's a change well, of the guard. The, the many different feints that Volkanovski was thrown out at Aldo had Aldo thrown, uh, froze up from the get-go, the shoulder feints, the, the fake level changes, and then attacking the lead leg of Aldo, inside low kicks over and over and over again, pushing him up against the fence and kneeing it there too. Very intelligent performance from Alexander Volkanovsky, and I actually kind of like his chances of defeating the likes of Max Holloway. But Zane, I got a really good comment in, in the live chat from Aaron Sterling, who wants to talk about that slam from Andrade was damn near a spike and spiking in mixed martial arts is, is illegal and, and it was a it was like a close to a pile driver it was almost her head straight up and down 
it's dangerous. I, I'm glad you brought this up, and I'm glad you've told it to me because I have a whole rant already ready for this. Nice. Which is basically two parts. A, spiking. Nobody in the history of Major League MMA has ever been penalized. Or penal, penalized, not penal, whatever. Penalized for a spike. It's never fucking happened. Never once. There's not one person who's ever had a point taken for a spike. Don't look for it. Don't think about it. Don't talk about it. It basically doesn't exist as an MMA rule. Because the way a spike works is you pick somebody straight up and you drop them straight down on their head. If there's an arc, if they are at all con in control of your body and responsible for the arc at which they're slammed, at all, it's not a spike. So in the case of Rose Namajunas, not only did she get dumped from a crotch lift over onto her head, she had to arc, she also was grabbing onto Andrade's arm, trying to get a Kimura, and you even heard Cormier say, af right after the KO slam, normally when I do that, people flip all the way through onto their back, but because Rose was hanging onto that Kimura, she got slammed right on her head. That means Rose Namajunas is responsible for the angle at which she got dropped. And that means it's not a spike. Beyond the fact that just the rules of a spike make it almost impossible to ever call one. Because the person getting spiked would basically have to not resist at all. And I'm beyond okay with that. They should yeah. be legal. Just as legal as a 12 to 6 elbow. Yeah. These are dumbass rules that are archaic and don't belong in modern MMA. Because yeah. why can't you spike? Like jujitsu rules, I get it. Like, this is IBJJF, you know, you don't want everyone power bombing people out of triangles and yeah. spiking everyone out of arm bars because it kind of takes away from what they're there to do. I get that. But like, this is fucking mixed martial arts. Like, you're already taking the kicks and knees to the downed opponent. Like, get this spike bullshit talk out of here. Yeah, like, spikes and 12 to 6 elbows are rules that basically were made to make MMA look safe and have no real practical purpose but the spike especially like i said 12 to 6 elbows we've seen we've seen fighters dq'd for that john jones you will never find a major you know a major mma promotion ufc pride bellator anything like that where there was a spike that got somebody dq'd or even got a point taken dude i've seen a kickboxing bout where a dude got spiked and like he lost the guy that got spiked lost because he couldn't continue and he was paralyzed. It was a fight that mm. happened in China. Like, yeah, it just yeah, no one's calling that shit. Well, let's talk more about how Rose contributed to how she landed on her neck by trying for that Kimura that she got in the first round. It was able to keep her from being slammed on her head in the first round, and she transitioned it into an armbar in the second round. She was unable to get the Kimura, she lost the grip, and as soon as she did, she got picked up and then started to be dumped, but she kept trying to grab for the arm. Rose uh -huh. did almost everything right the entire fight, right up until the time where she ended up sleeping on the canvas, by being on her back foot, throwing straight shots, and then playing Matador to Jessica Andrade. Um, everything was picture perfect for what she needed to do to beat Andrade, but she still lost. Do you think that if they ran it back, Zane, um, that, that she could get the game plan a little more honed in and defeat Andrade? Or do you think that Andrade is just too powerful? I don't know. I mean, this was the thing. Is it, like, miles out, when Andrade beat Claudia Gadella and Rose Namajunas lost to Carolina Kovalkovich, which happened both within a few months of each other, miles out, I was thinking, like, Andrade is a really bad matchup for Rose Namajunas. And it's just, yeah. like, this was Rose Namajunas fighting the perfect fight. And at some point, that pure, raw, brute physicality still got to her. Like, she just yeah. does not want to fight going backwards. She doesn't want to. She can do it for a while. But sooner or later, she's going to get caught up. She's going to get clinched. She's going to get slammed. Or she's just going to get, you know, she's going to get pushed in a way she doesn't want to be pushed. And you heard it even after the fight. She's talking about Losing is a relief, all that. She's talking about all the mental pressure. And I think it's just that kind of pressure gets to her. And, you know, like, I would be, say, I would say it's more like 60-40 on the Andrade side. I don't think Rose Namajunas could never win. She obviously was tuning Andrade up. But it's still clear just how much the basic aspect of this is a brutal matchup for Namajunas because it, it only took one mistake. 
This it was the, it's the physicality. And I was t- I was talking to Brian about this like before the fight how like my heart really wanted Rose to win and I know how great she is at striking and how good of a job yeah. Trevor Whitman has done at molding her into just a real lethal counter striker. Like, yeah. she was just that check hook was just landing at will early in the fight. Like it was real pretty uh-huh. shit she was doing. Like top shelf shit. Like yeah, men's, women's, MMA, whatever. Like as far as a mixed mixed martial artist, that's top shelf shit. Like yeah. absolutely beautiful. But like I was telling Brian, like it's the physicality of Andrade that makes her so special. And I just couldn't trust that Rose could fight that off for the the duration of a fight. Andrade is just so strong and she throws with so much power, so much oomph. And if she isn't connecting there, she's at least coming forward so violently and and in such a way that she puts herself in grappling positions. And yeah, Rose got fucking slammed. Like I I, I knew the physicality was gonna matter, but I didn't think it was gonna manifest into a fucking slam. Like that's epic shit. Like you don't see slams like that anymore. The crazy part about this is, though, is that I still think that Nami Yunus is actually a- absolutely poison for Joanna Yanjechik, and I still think that Joanna Yanjechik is absolutely poison for Jessica Andrade because Yanjechik yeah. fights off takedowns really hard and absolutely can play the Matador for five rounds and just circle away because Yanjechik wants these days she wants to fight out in open space. She wants to be on the back foot. She wants to be, to be far away, filling space with the volume making you come after her. That's what makes her happy. And so she's all too happy to do that to to uh, Andrade forever. That's what I was going to ask know? you, Zane. So you mentioned that Rose does not like fighting off the back foot. Ioana and Jacek has already defeated Jessica Andrade by doing that. Do you think that mm-hmm. that is what's next for Jessica Andrade? Do you think that she should fight uh, Ioana and Jacek in a rematch, even though Ian Jacek's last fight, I believe, was against Valentina Shevchenko? Or do you think that Andrade should fight a new challenger, a new challenge for herself in the winner of Tatiana Suarez versus Nina Anseroff, which happens next month at UFC 238. I I would say let let uh, Joanna come back to 115 and get a win and book book Andrade against somebody else. Book her against uh, Tatiana Suarez if she beats Nina Anseroff, which I think she will. Mm-hmm. That fight will be cool if Tatiana Suarez wins that. That will be a fresh fight for Joanna to take, assuming that she wins whatever fight she gets matched up with, and most of that division is a good matchup for Joanna. And if she, you know, and because if you just run back Joanna Andrade again, like people have seen that fight, Joanna is one of the bigger draws in that division, but she's still not a draw on her own. So you, there's no real upside to just running that fight back right away. You're talking about, you know, a fight some people care about a, versus a fight that only a few people care about, but neither one is a fight that everybody cares about. And it's, in the ESPN era especially, they don't really need draws. So just make a new fight and let Joanna get a win back before she fights for the title again. Sounds good to me. Eddie, let's get into a shining star or a WTF of the card. I'd prefer a WTF, but you can do whatever you want, man. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think a WTF could be just how much I hated this card for how many like cold knockouts we got. <laughs> people just went cold, like yeah. separated for their senses, and I'm all over here like, man, fuck this card. <laughs> how spoiled are we when we're like shitting on this card with so many epic like one punch knock like one punch walk off knockouts? Yeah, it's insane. Like, how is that even possible to hate that? Partially, it's because watching a whole bunch of old Brazilians get whooped in Brazil. Like, I don't even care about that. Though. I know, like, I know. The but fights it, it, themselves were just... Uh. Well, yeah, but it, it's still watching old fighters get waxed. Like, watching Anderson Silva's leg blow up again. Yeah, watching, watching BJ and, Penn get... <laughs> watching BJ Penn get just... Show, show for by one round. Guida. In a fight where Clay Guida's boxing actually looked like it took a step back from his recent fights. Mm-hmm. And Penn still couldn't hang. <laughs> and then watching Little Nog just get totally, totally mm-hmm. waxed out of there. Like, 
there's not a lot of feel good in any of those. And like, I think a bigger part was the, the just trying to get over the fact that it this was a pay per view. Yeah, mm-hmm. I just couldn't shake that, and I, it made me a little angry because like it's it's not epic. There's nothing epic about this. Definitely not worth. Bet six Although it's just it how fucking loud the crowd movie. got for Jared Cannonier. That was pretty epic. Like I was hearing that live, and then I saw somebody else like they they played a video from it from like backstage filming it. And it was just deafening throughout. And that was just like, yeah. not, nothing to do with Brazilians or Brazil's reputation or anything like that. But I, I still was just like, man, security better be escorting Jared Cannonier out of the building. Like yeah. anytime a crowd has that much hostility, I don't care where they are. You better be taking that guy like through the back routes and, you know, put the coat over him. Zane, how do, you, how do you think that Kenneer handled that. What do you think about how he handled it? Because the crowd was booing him. Obviously, they were going to do that no matter what. No matter if he beat Anderson Silva, whatever, they put a mic in front of him, the crowd was going to boo him. Instead of doing the normal thing, like, hey, you're booing me because I, I beat your guy. That's okay. I understand he's your guy. I still love you and I still respect you. Instead, he's like, hey, you don't like me? Fuck you. But- I mean, I don't care how Kenneer handled it. <laughs> Frankly, like, he might as well do that. Because being nice and respectful, he's in a money sport. He's in a sport where people well, are supposed to pay attention. But like, like you said, he's he's in that hostile territory. If you'd have just said, hey, guys, I still love you, maybe they don't need the coat to run him in the back. Yeah, well. Yeah, but then he won't be as big of a draw the next time he goes down there. Yeah, like, you got to... You gotta take what I, you gotta take what you're given, and he was given a position where he was gonna be hated, and oh, that's he might as well lead into the hate. it's not like Cannoneers out there doing the Colby Covington thing. I don't expect him to like make a whole <laughs> shtick out of being hated all the time just because he wants to. It's just like you got you got the you have the hand you're dealt, and the hand you're dealt is you, you are gonna piss everybody off, especially hurting Anderson Silva like that. Just. You might as well. Like, I don't know. I mean, yeah. these guys are fist fighting in a cage for money. I don't expect them to be that <laughs> nice of people. Yeah, that's absolutely true. My WTF of the card will just go to Luana Carolina versus Priscilla Cachoeira. And it's a why the fuck. Yeah. Why the fuck was that a UFC contest? <laughs> that would be a, a uh, prelim at, at an LFA event. That was some low-level mixed martial arts. Yeah, I don't know. I'll, 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 I'll end up having to rewatch it, I know. But it was a trash fire. At least it was a fun trash fire. Yeah. I take that over Clay Guida, BJ Penn, five days a week right now, honestly. I suppose. Yeah, well, BJ Penn and both both him and Anderson Silva are probably going to try to do the damn thing again. And that's an also a why the fuck. Just book them against each other. I would so watch that. Yeah. <laughs> I love that fight. <laughs> Just at this he point, fought, he fought Leonardo Machida. Be yeah. defended once yeah. upon a time. Why not? They haven't both haven't got a win in like a decade. Like he wouldn't be down to not have to weigh in at 155 pounds. BJ That's right. That. You see BJ Penn just stuffing himself with hot dogs. Like I'm ready. I'm ready. Put me in, coach. They can have like a hot dog eating contest beforehand. It yeah, could be like right. a tri a triathlon. It could be like a hot dog eating contest, an MMA match, and then, I don't know, something fun for the third event. A (laughs) dance-off. There you go. I feel like uh, uh, Capoeira kind of has that bag. This is a Capoeira match. Oh, but see, but that's why you have have the eating contest on one end, because you know BJ is going to win that. (laughs) You got the dance contest on the other end, you know Anderson's going to take that. You got the fight in the middle, and... I like where this is going. Yeah. But it should happen... And like the co-main event at the LFA, not. <laughs> Aw, see that just hurts. Yeah. All I mean, right. Yeah, let, you can go. You can go. I'll let you. Go. <laughs> I mean, we're gonna ride off on that note. You can find me on Twitter at these same time, and you can find Eddie on Twitter at the Eddie Mercado. You can find both of us over at bloodyelbow.com. We're gonna jump over and do the sixth round. You can find that dropping on Bloody Elbow Presents on SoundCloud, iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, all that good stuff. That'll be dropping. Tomorrow, I believe, maybe late tonight. I don't know. Hang out. Subscribe to the feed. You'll find it. Thanks, everyone. And thanks for having us, Brian. No problem, Zane. Thanks for being here. 
Eddie, I almost feel like we don't even need an extra special something at the end of this episode because we've been talking for like three straight hours. This is true. This is true. But I'm still here nonetheless. The what next we, thing I was going to mention. Uh, the next thing I was going to mention on the show is how. <clears throat> just choked on my own spit there. How great of a fucking job Herb Dean did in the stoppage of Anderson Silva from Jared oh, Cannonier. Who gets the shining star? He gets the shining star. Herb Dean does. Which is fucking that's, awesome because he's dealt with a lot of scrutiny from early stoppages, late stoppages, and everything in the past, and that was an absolutely perfect stoppage by Herb Dean for Anderson Silva there. Shining yeah, star the last sure. thing I wanted to see the last thing I wanted to see was him getting pummeled unnecessarily while he's holding his knee. And screaming. I didn't need to do that. Especially watch, after watching BJ just get beat up. That wasn't fun either. Well, especially there was a lot of a lot of low moments on the card and that would have been and it was already a low moment anderson silva going down by that knee injury it would have made it even worse if you'd have got knocked out afterward with a ground strike oh man i, I would have turned it off <laughs> i would have just stopped <laughs> so i'm done with mma yeah, yeah. Fuck it. all right well i'm gonna go run it do the sixth round we'll be back next week for what is it what's going down next week ufc fight night Rafael Dos Anjos versus Kevin, the Motown Phenom Lee, UFC Fight Night 152, UFC on ESPN Plus 10, May the 18th in Rochester, New York. Ooh, an NY card. It's Ooh. it's not a very great card, but we've got Vicente Luque, Charles Oliveira on the card. Sounds good to me. Fuck yeah. That's uh, and, great. And, well, they're not fighting each other, obviously, but... Uh, and no, 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 they're both just killers. Yeah. I, Different weight classes, but yeah. Yep, that's going to be dope. All right, man, I'll talk to you next week. All right, bros, stay safe. See you later, buddy. All right, fight fans, if this is your first time being here, you need to know that after Eddie and Zane leave, myself, Flying Brian J, stays here to captain the rest of the show with you, the live commenters, as my co-host. If you didn't know, you can get the audio only of this post-fight show on my personal podcast feed, which you can find by searching for Flying Brian Show everywhere you find podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, uh, Spotify, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, all that shit. Search for Flying Brian Show, or you can search for Bloody Elbow Presents. Losers here. Thanks for being here, my dude. RC Kim. Um... Ravi Pratap Singh. I don't, I don't know. My first question to you guys is, what post-fight rating would you give this entire night of fights? Not just the main event, not just the main card, the entirety of UFC 237, top to bottom. And let's go this time 1 to 10. What would you give it out of 10? Nathan Cohen, do you think the MMA gods sacrificed Silva's leg because we were rooting against uh, <coughs> Thug Rose? And if so, are you satisfied with the trade-off? He's referring to a tweet that I posted earlier today that I was rooting against Rose Nami Yunus. And I don't have a good reason for rooting against her. It's kind of like you don't like somebody, but you don't know why you don't like them. I just I wanted Rose to lose earlier today a little bit of it is because um she she beat the shit out of uh the karate hottie michelle waterson when i was there live in one of the two events i've ever been to live so i was like negative on her on that and i also kind of thought that yoani and jacek won that last fight between the two of them and so i just kind of wanted to see her lose am i satisfied with the trade-off fuck no i would have gladly have taken thug rose winning in the first round and then anderson silva winning a boring decision because Anderson Silva is my favorite fighter in the world. Ravi says, why were you biased, man, against Rose? I wasn't biased against her in the live video, was I? I don't know. Josh Sanchez said he'd give it a, a 4 out of 10. David Bausquila says a 4 out of 10. Daniel Purr says the a seven, the undercard saved it. Paid programming says five because of the main event. Ravi says six point five out of ten. RC Kim two point five out of ten. MTS Mir says four out of ten. 
Loser says, in honor of Andrade, I gave it a 6.9. I, I question that rating. Priam Al Almenian, Almenian says, 4 out of 10. Marcus McGahey, 5 out of 10. Priam says the pay-per-view was lame today. The pay-per-view was kind of lame today. The first two were just like, what, I didn't even need to watch them, you know? They weren't necessary. They definitely weren't pay-per-view worthy fights. I'm talking about Irene Aldana defeating Betcha Gohea via armbar late in the third round. I'm talking about uh, Star Apoli defeating Tiago Alves, 30-27, 30-27, 29, 28. Those two fights weren't the best. And Alexander Volkanovsky versus Jose Aldo, I thought would be violent as fuck. And like, yes. And it was just kind of violent. And there wasn't any ebbs or flows. Like Zane said during the main portion of this post-fight show, Volkanovsky took over right away. And uh, Jose Aldo never got out of first gear. Never got out of first gear. In fact, I believe the stats say that Aldo landed nine strikes in the first round, 20 in the second round, so props to him there, and then eight in the third round. So between the first and third rounds, he landed less strikes than he did in the second round, which is just insane to me. The next question we need to go over is what is your guys's what the fuck of the card? And also, who would you give your post-fight bonuses to? Remember that we give out five post-fight bonuses. So you could give one fight of the night and three post-fight bonuses, two fights of the night and one post-fight bonus, or you could give out five post-fight bonuses. I'm going to give post-fight bonuses to Jessica Andrade, Ryan Spann, Warley Alves, and Viviani Araujo. So Araujo, Alves... Andrage, Span. Is that all? Viviani Araujo knocked out Talita Bernardo in the third round with an overhand right, one punch knockout. It does not happen in women's bantamweight division very often, but it did in the curtain jerker. And at that point, we thought we were off on a skyrocket to a fucking violence land on this fight card, but. Then shortly after, we had Luana Carolina versus Priscilla Cachoeira, and also BJ Penn versus Clay Guida, which just took the steam right out of everybody's sails. <clears throat> Priam says, I'm sorry, but the card doesn't deserve or doesn't warrant five post-fight bonuses. And I kind of agree. I do, I do kind of agree. RC Kim, I didn't I don't see how Rose dissecting Andrage before getting Death Valley drivered can lose what the fuck moment of the card. Yeah, well like what the fuck moment of the card I usually use for things outside of just like moments in the fight. So I use it for like a referee doing something weird or something weird happening in the crowd or somebody being a real asshole. Daniel Alves says, you guys are not talking about her neck injury. I feel like she was, was super worried about it when the slam happened. Daniel Alves is referring to Rose Nami Yunus and possibly injuring her neck when she got slammed on it. I was worried too because I thought this is not something I want to see. I don't want to see somebody get paralyzed live. But shortly after she was knocked out, they woke her up. They put her on a stool. They looked at her. She like... She was awake and alert, and she even did a post-fight interview. But, okay, here's my real what the fuck of the card. After I'd say Josh's, Josh Sanchez, he says, what the fuck moment of the card was ESPN Plus being absolute trash again. My stream crashed two times per fight on the main card portion on ESPN Plus. At least two times per fucking fight. So my stream crashed ten times 
during the main card portion on ESPN Plus. It, I don't know what the fuck it did. It just like would like had it full screen. It would go small screen, and then I have to hit play again. Ten times. What the fuck, ESPN Plus? And also, I'm trying to click play on the main card portion after I already purchased it at 9:05. I'm trying to hit play. Nothing. It says it says it's still the prelims, and I can't get the main card yet. I'm like, the prelims are fucking over. The prelims end at nine. The main the main card is supposed to start at nine. That's when they do the uh, face the pain. But no, I couldn't click on it. And then finally, like 9:07, it it said, okay, you can hit it now. What the fuck, ESPN Plus bunch of. I don't like the transition to ESPN Plus so far. I think it's it's crazy. Josh says his shit just kept randomly pausing and it was bizarre. Mine paused a couple of times too. What the fuck? Fruit Salad says after UFC 236 and then I'm going to add on this event, UFC 237, it's just kind of looking sad. UFC 236 did around 100,000 pay-per-view buys. I think this one will do less because they're hiding it behind. Uh, you have to buy ESPN Plus first, $5 a month or whatever, and then you buy the pay-per-view. And they say, oh, well, the pay-per-view is only 6 bucks now. Well, let me do some fucking math. Or 60 bucks instead of 65 bucks. Let me do that fucking math. $5 for ESPN Plus, 60 for the pay-per-view, bam, $65. It's not $5 cheaper, you assholes. I don't... Whatever. AJO510, that's why I refuse to buy a pay-per-view. And he just watches it illegally. Daniel Alva says, I mentioned the net because it's something she was dealing with oh, way before the fight. When she got slammed, I thought she was ready to tap because of that. Not just because of the power hit. I forgot about that. She had um, a broken vertebrae, right? That's why she's been out for over a year. She had a broken vertebrae. Great point, Daniel. That is something we should be paying more attention to. I'm excited to go on MMAmania.com and find out more about that when we're done with this post-fight show. RC Kim, this was one of my what-the-fuck moments of the night, not of the card, but he says the what-the-fuck moment of the night was actually on Bellator for me when Jack Swagger said, laying on a fat man and hugging him tight gave him a giant boner. That's not what he said. That's what R.C. Kim said. But the what the fuck moment was Jack Swagger fought an absolute can. A guy who's 1-1, one one, clearly no athletic ability whatsoever. Maybe the guy, the guy could probably beat my ass, and that's fine. I'm not a fighter. But Jack Swagger is a former professional wrestler. He's got a background in like uh, freestyle grappling, wrestling, embracing the grind, as Mike Goldberg would say. He goes out there against this guy who's clearly not on his level in physicality, in skill set whatsoever gets him in an arm triangle choke and the referee tries to pry him off of the arm triangle and he won't let go of it the referee had, had to fucking full-on maul him to get him off it was a very Husamal paul harris moment by jack swagger he had an opportunity in the post fight interview to make an excuse for it to make the fans less angry about his holding on to that submission for too long against the can who he was put up against and he says hey fuck you if you don't like it I'm in there to win, and I held it until I thought it was over. And then he said that he had a boner and that he was rock hard because he was uh, hard with emotion. What the fuck? And also, fuck you, Jake Hager, Jack Swagger. Fuck that guy. David says he's now a fan of that guy, I guess. David Bulskila. Um, Ravi says no excuse for holding submission too long and they should be fined what the fuck Jack Swagger absolutely Priam asks who, how many fights does Anderson Silva have left on his contract I think that he signed a 10 fight deal after he beat uh, I need to stop saying uh, or, um, I'm so mad at myself for that I think he signed a 10 fight deal after he beat Stefan Bonner so 1, 2, 3 Four, five, six, seven, eight. He would have two fights left on that contract. I can't believe he signed a 10-fight deal. That's insane to me. 
But he's looking for a contract extension. It was in the news this week that he's looking for more fights on his contract. I don't want to see him fight anymore. Yeah, he's obviously fragile. He's really old. He's proven everything he needs to prove in mixed martial arts. I get that he gets paid $600,000 every time he steps in the cage, but I think we can all agree that we don't really need to see Anderson Silva fight anymore. Daniel Purr says, who do you see, Who do I want to see a Cannoneer fight next? He's improving every fight. I would love to see him against Khalil Roundtree. That's a good uh, – well, Khalil Roundtree's um, a light heavyweight. I was thinking it just makes sense that Cannoneer would fight Derek Brunson. Derek Brunson's coming off of that decision over Elias Theodoru. you got similar time frames. They're going to be ranked similar come Monday. I think that Jared Cannonier versus Derek Brunson is what I would make. Rob Amon's roster cuts. BJ Penn, Kurt Hollibaugh, Lil Nog, Tiago Alves, and you missed one, Rob, Priscilla Cachoeira. Obviously not UFC caliber. She was my first cut. I thought of you, Rob, when her fight was happening. Cut her immediately. She has to leave. Um, Antonio Rogerio Noguera, I think he needs to retire. BJ Penn needed to retire a long time ago. And Kurt Hollibaugh is on a two-fight, he's on a three-fight losing streak. He has not won a fight in the UFC. So, yes, Kurt Hollibaugh has to be gone as well. <laughs> Sorry, RC Kim. We could cover the fights more. Warley Alves hit Sergio Marais with a left uppercut that that crumbled him. That fight was a very, very good performance by Warley Alves. I wouldn't say master class, but it's a very nice rebound for him since he lost to the James Krause in Lincoln, Nebraska, and I believe August. He got outstruck, and he got finished by James Krause. In this fight, he hit Sergio Marais with a lot, a lot, a fucking ton, a plethora, a cornucopia of leg kicks. Chopped Sergio Marais down, uh, was being very patient and accurate with his strikes. Ended up getting Sergio Marais on the ropes, up against the fence, and a uppercut from hell slept him. That is one reason why I would give it a post-fight bonus. Derek Blakely says, actually train before you act like you know, but yep, never hold a submission while being picked up unless you are select few who can land safe and maintain control. Just let it go. Acting like I, I don't train, I don't know. All I'm going off of is what Daniel Cormier said. I don't know why you had to come in here with that negativity, Derek, talking to me that way. I'm just a regular guy doing a post-fight show here, trying to interact with you cats. Yeah, no reason for that negativity. We could talk about the rest of these fights, but I don't think we need to. We covered most of it. We've had a good time. The fight card overall was not very good. You guys even said it yourselves. Oh, you don't think he was directing it toward me? Oh, sorry, Andres. Andres. Orduna. My bad. The, you guys are chatting a lot, you know. Really good with the comment section tonight, so that's... It's moving forward fast. I always assume everything's negative about me, and I always gotta defend myself. Lavona, Vaughn. Lavona Vaught. Yeah, what's next for Alexander Volkanovsky? He's going to fight Max Holloway, Jared Cannonier versus Derek Brunson, Jessica Andrade versus the winner of Tatiana Suarez versus Nina Anserov. I was thinking about what's next for Warley Alves. I don't know. I'd love to see him submit Colby Covington again. That'd be a lot of fun. Maybe the winner of. Vicente Luque versus uh, Neil Magny next week. That'd be something. That would make a lot of sense. But yeah, I'm going to get out of here for tonight, guys. I'm going to watch the post fight. 
press conference. I'm going to watch Bellator, which I missed. I heard the results. Don't tell them in the comment section, but I'm going to watch those fights. And for now, I'm going to out of here. I'll see you next week on the post-fight show for UFC Fight Night 152. Namaste.